I think one of the things that is critical to us getting back into an even keel one day, one of us being a democracy that functions properly, uh, one of us, one of the things that is absolutely critical in terms of improving communications between us all, uh, and also making sure that we have a functioning democracy, a functioning economy, in which everybody can play a part, um, is education. And what we have learned this week, um, as a result, it was a very good interview, can I say, do watch it on the Facebook channel for the platform uh, Rodney Hyde was talking on the latest research to do with uh, reading achievement in this country. And there has been an article this week, uh, very good. And so sometimes the mainstream media, when they stick to the facts, do an outstanding job. And could I compliment the New Zealand Herald and those who wrote um, or have written a three-part series this week on New Zealand's appalling literacy rate and the dr almost the, it's dropped off almost a cliff to the point where so many New Zealanders are going to be denied, so many young New Zealanders in particular, the opportunity to participate uh, as full members of our society because they simply do not have the educational background or the literacy or numeracy skills um, to be anything other than, to be honest with you, almost prime fodder for the welfare cues of the future. Um, joining us to talk about that this morning is somebody who was interviewed as part of that uh, and has a real interest in literacy and improving um, the quality of education in this country and providing genuine opportunity to those currently denied it is Carla McNeil. And Carla is the Director of Learning Matters. Carla, welcome to the show. Good morning to you. Morena. Thanks for having me. Listen, you do God's work. Um, tell me, first of all, a little about, about Learning Matters, what it is, what it does. Sure. So um, we are an education business specialising in literacy support and um, evidence-based literacy instruction for all students. And predominantly we work with schools across New Zealand, supporting them to implement um, up-to-date evidence-based instruction in, um, at the moment in spelling and reading. Uh, we've come from over the past five years developing a very, very successful intervention model also in a private setting and we're now involved in the Ministry of Education trial where we are one of three providers trialling um, literacy intervention support for students in uh, years three to eight. Now, um, I read a bit of your background and your bio. Um, you, we have a bit of some commonality. I'll talk to that about that in a second. <laughs> but you've been, you've been a classroom teacher. You've been a school principal. I imagine it's a primary school principal. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, you're a maths advisor at the University of Waikato, Waikato. But the thing that really intrigued me is that you assisted your own son, William, as mm. he went through dyslexia, APD. I don't know what that is, but... He also had ADD, which my son has as well, ADD and ADHD. Um, what's, right. What, first yes. of all, what's, what's APD? Can you take, you know, take me through that? Sure. Um, APD is auditory processing disorder. So um, in very basic terms, it's where <clears throat> your ear can hear, but the message that gets to your brain is slightly distorted and different from what your ear is hearing. So when we take our children for a hearing assessment, it looks as though everything's all honky-dory and they can hear. Um, however, the messaging that's getting through to the brain in terms of the quality and clarity of sound is not quite as precise. Right. And so we know, and we and we know that speech and sound are such a strong component of learning to read and write. And so students who present with auditory processing disorder often do have a little bit more challenge in um, picking up the basic code and becoming successful readers and writers. Okay. Well, the reason I've shared your bio with listeners is is very simply to establish your credibility in the field of education and obviously your passion for what you do. But before we get into that, can you explain to me why New Zealand's reading standard literacy results um, are so much lower than they were 20 years ago? Mm, sure. Um, one of the big um, sticking points is that we have continued to teach um, in a way that actually, to be really honest, is not completely evidence-based. So we've adopted whatever the terminologies we use, whether we talk balanced literacy or we talk 
whole language. What actually underpins those teaching approaches is a method called three queuing. And so um, there's a lot of guesswork involved and parents will have experienced this and teachers will have experienced this themselves too. And I did as a teacher and a school principal. When we were sitting with our children and they were reading to us, and they didn't know a word on the page, we were saying things to them like, it's okay, read to the end of the line, and then what do you think that word might be? Or, um, you know, just taking yeah. notice of the first letter, or yeah. let's look at the picture. What is the picture telling us? What we now know, and so that practice has gone on in New Zealand for years and years and years, yeah. and what we know is practice makes permanent. So that practice has become so ingrained in our classrooms in New Zealand that it's very, very, very hard to shift um, actually those behaviours. What we now know, though, is that there is so much more research around how the brain learns to read. And further to that, we know about teaching approaches and implementation models within schools and within classrooms that actually will ensure that teachers become knowledgeable about the process of learning to read and that they are given the correct resources and steps to ensure that when they're teaching, they are actually activating the specific brain parts of those little people and big people and helping them to develop cumulative literacy skills. So we've stayed, um, we've stayed in the same trench, digging the same hole for years and years without coming up and looking around the fields and seeing what else is going on and is anybody else digging their trench in a different way. And actually, um, we've been digging a tunnel pretty much to nowhere. It's time to stop digging that tunnel and to really, really um, develop a common practice model in education um, that is, is, is completely evidence-based. Carla, the thing that strikes me most, and I've read the New Zealand Herald articles this week, I've also read um, some of the PISA um, school results for New Zealand right. as well, and, and the, the results are published. The thing that gets me most is that at what point does the education system decide that it's going to go down a philosophical road rather than simple evidence, research and science? I don't mm. get that. Mm. I mean, that, that mm. is a, a, they've betrayed a generation of readers, a, a generation of New Zealanders um, who would have, have struggled at school. Um, not yeah. had the help that they need. How did they get yeah, into adopting a philosophy rather than something which is clearly evidence-based? Yeah, that's a really good question. And unfortunately, it's not one I can answer because I'm not them. And so, you know, I think one of the things that I'm really proud of about the work that we do here at Learning Matters is we literally employ a team of people who have come out of classrooms, who have experienced this um, science <coughs> of reading and have experienced structured literacy and have come out and, and want to be part of influencing the shift across the country. So um, I, I can't answer why. But it's, it's bizarre, know, isn't it? Because really this is it all is about, it's, it's, it it, is. but it's also about politics. I mean, you've got to almost enter a political process, which I'm sure you've done, um, to try yeah, and affect absolutely. the change at a, at, a, at, a, at a bureaucratic level. So this is a... Absolutely. It's, it's appalling. I, I just, I mean, it's, I think, it's I a think, manifest failing. It is a manifest failing, but I do think that this is where we have to put the political football aside because, you know, the ability, it, it is a human right to learn to read. Absolutely. It is actually a human right to learn to read. Yep. And it is time that we put <coughs> this political football of reading and the teaching of literacy. It, it cannot be passed from party to party and this party believes and has a preference to listen to this university or this party believes and has a pre um, preference to listen to this, we actually need to have um, uh, education, and particularly literacy and mathematics education in this country. We need a quality core group of specialists driving this forward. And I do believe that, you know, I really honestly do believe that the conversations that I have had with politicians, I honestly believe that there is genuine intent to make this difference. The question is, Will it be enough and will it be fast enough? Because, you know, I'm the parent of um, William is nearly 20 mm. and I have fought tooth and nail since he was four years old um, 
because I knew something wasn't right. And, you know, I was a school principal myself and with all due respect, I can honestly stand up and I do stand up and say that I had no idea truly. If you actually sat down and asked me when I was school principal, I could not have explained to you the process of how children learn to read. Now, I think that is unacceptable that we have um, leaders and teachers in our country who we do not afford the opportunity to invest in quality um, professional development and building their knowledge and then giving them the tools to be able to teach our children to learn to read. Um, it's just, it's not okay. And this is happening, this shift is happening all around the globe. This isn't just New Zealand. You know, we, we are currently being coached ourselves by some international experts out of um, universities in Australia who are really, really helping us to influence the shift in New Zealand. And it is happening in the States, it's happening in the UK, it is happening everywhere. And I really encourage parents, I encourage teachers, I encourage school, school principals to lean into the conversation and to be okay to be to be comfortable to be uncomfortable and to be you know really vulnerable because at the end of the day we have to improve the literacy rates in this country oh, guessing at words guessing at words is totally not okay and telling students words you know we have to get in and teach quality foundation skills in a systematic and cumulative way Carla, um, the fact you and I have sons that might otherwise, well, will struggle through uh, a compulsory education system also highlights for me when I look at the success rates of boys compared to girls. Now, if those, mm. if those results were reversed, I would suggest to you that there would be a reaction amongst many in the political <laughs> and educational spheres that girls were being discriminated against mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. we would need to intervene to ensure that they were given the same opportunity as boys. But at the moment, yeah. I see nobody anywhere advocating that boys are being let down on a daily basis by an education system that will see them achieve nowhere near the same levels as young girls um, and adolescent girls. Yeah, I think there are a lot of parents who are out there advocating for particularly for their children who are dyslexic or um, perhaps undiagnosed dyslexics, you know, and a lot of parents, you see it on social media, they're reaching out and they're saying, what's going on? Mm. You know, they're frustrated. Mm. And unfortunately, in some parts of the country, they're getting that same old adage of he's a boy you know, it'll click, just give him time, he's not developmentally ready. Well, when you become very, very familiar with the neuroscience and the development of the reading brain, there are some children that will never show you that they're ready. They might be 15, 16, 43, and actually still have the same reading development as they did when they were five because nobody has explicitly taught them and helped them to build that and I'm, I'm kind of deviating from your question a little bit but what I do want to add to this piece that it's important for people to be aware of is that I'm going to say our previous teaching methods until this point in time because we actually work with 70 schools across New Zealand who implement this practice plus we have a whole lot of schools using um, our teaching approach in an independent capacity so this previous way that we have been teaching and you know schools are moving away from um, in New Zealand is really grounded in the um, in the belief that learning to read is just like learning to speak now learning to read is a recent human invention as was highlighted in that Herald article um, it's actually of some 8,000 years ago and so we must really pick up on that and we must take note of what the science and evidence is telling us because when we know better we can do better and What's really, really exciting to come back to your question is that in the schools that we have the privilege to partner with, we are seeing those boys that were previously underserved flourish like there is no tomorrow. The social implications for these students who, you know, we hear stories from teachers who will say to us, 
um, these these um, or this particular student actually didn't have any friends. He didn't have the capability to mm. make friends. Mm. He was so down in the dumps. Mm. But he's coming to these intervention sessions, and as a result, he's got increased confidence. He's talking to students within this group, and we've actually seen him playing with people in the playground. You know, and like I just think that is such a wonderful example of how you know him being identified as having literacy needs getting the right support, having success in his learning is clearly having a positive impact on the social aspect of his life and um, him feeling like he's got something to, to offer. No, no, listen, and, oh, and, and, and listen, so uh, exciting. well, and the other thing that I think comes out of this, um, Carla, is that, uh, the kids that are oh, let's just let's just extrapolate for a moment and think of all the kids that are failing in our education system at the moment. Um, mm. it, it does it affects them psychologically and emotionally for the rest of their lives. Uh, they are denied the Absolutely. same opportunities as everybody else, and then we wonder why they join gangs, uh, ram raid dairies, um, and and take methamphetamine in large quantities. Um, yes. If, yeah. if you if you're alienated from the society in which you live. There's there's no there's no incentive to join it really is there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, opportunity is the key word for me in what you just said. You know, I think um, one door opens and that leads you to a hallway where there's another door that Absolutely. you have the opportunity yep. to open. Yep. If the door is closed for you, you're locked in that room. And you know, I think what we want to do is we want to see as many doors open for these children, and we want to equip them to then be able to be in a position to choose the pathway that most interests them in their lifetime. We don't want to take the literacy card out of the mix and keep the door closed and then limit their choices for what they could go on um, go on and do um, and become. And that, that absolutely is such a key part. And for both of us, you know, I don't know how old your son is, but I know, I know for William when he was going to transition from secondary school, it was a really big deal for us to really kind of help him into how is he going to get into this farming industry that he is so passionate about. And um, and so, you know, I can tell you there's been an awful lot of hard work that's had to go into supporting him have the literacy skills that he needs to have. And, you know, if, if, if only, if only this teaching approach called structured literacy was in play when he was five years old, I can hand on heart promise you that his trajectory through school would have been entirely different and so would have many, many, many other children um, in this country. Yes. But it's here now well, and, you well, know, it is here now and we, 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 need to, um, we need to really keep our pedal to the middle, we need to keep the conversations going and we need all... We need all parents to really step up and ask their teachers from a place of um, ultimate respect because we must be aware that, you know, teachers... Well, can I just interrupt you on that bit though, Carla? Can I just interrupt you on that? I think teachers are very defensive. The teachers that I mm -hmm. have had engaged yeah. with on my children's learning um, yes. are, yeah. are, are naturally defensive when it, it comes to them, when you ask them questions. Um, they are secretive as well, yes, I, and they won't share necessarily <laughs> you know, uh, information that they have yeah. about your children. For example, um, just the standardised testings that's done, they won't share that until you yeah. press them to do so. The lack of communication mm. from schools to parents um, is appalling in this country as a general mm. rule. I think that's a representation of the knowledge of the sector. So that's, that, that has absolutely been my experience in the last five years working with schools in this particular area. What I see increases when schools learn more about how the brain learns to read, when they are equipped to teach with so much more rigour, when they learn about the importance of explicit instruction, teachers become empowered to be in those classrooms. What then happens is they educate their parent community that strengthens the relationship between parents and Fano, and then the whole dynamic of those conversation changes because the walls have dropped and the teachers have so much more 
so much more knowledge and so much more understanding to bring to bring to the table. The other thing I want to add to that too is that, you know, we want, as parents, we want our teachers to be aware if a child has a learning difference. We want them to understand. We have this little cycle that we work through um, here at Learning Matters and we say first step we have to be aware, second step we need to understand third step you can't have empathy until you have understanding you need to know what that person is experiencing and why they're facing the challenge they um, are but the next and so okay, but the next issue there also is um as parents um i've often said on the show it's been my life um work if it's, it's no matter what happens at that school um if they're going home to an environment which is negative, antisocial, um, mm-hmm. and it, it, it undermines on a daily basis, does it not, anything that might be achieved in that classroom. I guess what you'd, you'd be a bit more optimistic than that. You'd say, yes, but Michael, you've got to try, and you might just mm. make the difference. Is that, is that, would that be your reply to that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like I do, I'm kind of a... I don't see bar. I really work hard not to see barriers, but to see opportunity or to see, you know, possibilities of how we can lift relationships or impact relationships with people really positively and add value, and then they might be able to utilise that and move forward. But what I really do want to also point out is that if you actually stop and think about the schooling and education experience of some of those parents, it wouldn't have been great. And so this becomes yes, an that's right. generational yes, yes, you're experience, right. yeah. you know. Yeah, and yeah. so, and yeah. so, therefore, that's a fair point. I, th- I see that if we are able to create success yeah. within the education system yeah. in these basic core skills of literacy and numeracy, I truly believe that that will have social impact outside within our um, within our homes. And to be honest, some of the some of the communities that we work within, we absolutely see that happening, you know, and it's like um, success breeds success. We know that to be true. And so going back to that example of, you know, once teachers have more knowledge and they're understanding and they have more empathy, they then are much more willing to um, approach a parent in the playground or when they're picking up their student, you know, they just they are at ease and then that springboards off to the level of communication they can have with the parent. The parent becomes more knowledgeable. They are at ease. They may not have had a great experience themselves at yep. school, but they know that things are going to be different for their child. And that's the first step to changing that intergenerational um, cycle of what people, unfortunately, might just term as bad parenting or, you know, parents have to do their part. Well, those parents were kids at some stage too and what kind of deal did they get? Yep, no, fair point. Carla, they're, thank they're, you very... They're, they're, actually, they're actually just little people in big people's bodies at the end of the day. Yeah, we're not, you're not <laughs> wrong about that. Carla, <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, as I understand, you're now funded by the government to provide um, what a sort of a pilot program of this new um, methodology, is that correct? Yeah, so, so we are currently participating in a structured literacy intervention trial yeah. with two other That's providers. Right. Structured literature. Uh, we, yeah, yes. And so we, we are working um, with 15 schools um, we're working with 30 teachers in three different regions, yeah. and um, our, focus, our focus there has been on building teacher knowledge, giving the teachers some assessment tools that will really identify what's going on for those students, yeah. and then helping them um, implement a structured literacy teaching model, modelling teaching for them, coaching them, observing them, and then monitoring the rate of progress. And so, and so and as I understand, um, how, how long is this program going to last for? So this, this sort of pilot program, is it one, two years? Is it longer? It goes to December this year, and then I understand that the Ministry of Education will review the, the research findings, which will come out in March next year. And so if there is going to be a policy change, it won't happen... Uh, Oh, I suppose that it wouldn't happen until the next financial year, would it? Potentially. However, their financial year is slightly it's different. It's all over the show. So, yeah, um, that's right. And, and the, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, 
I think we're taking all the right steps forward. You know, so yep. what we've had is we've had yep. we've had um, the ministry and the government come out and say there is going to be a change with the curriculum. There is going to be um, recently. Dantonetti has released the action plan. The action plan has some some key indicators, but it also is missing some information that we might like to see being put in there. The next step is the common practice model that will be developed for teachers, and we hope that that practice model will will give some very, very clear steps for teachers because what we don't want to continue to happen in this country is for, one, teachers to be self-employed and teach whatever they individually believe is fit to be taught in their classrooms, and two... We need, um, when children go from school to school or class yeah, to class, this, this uniform we need thing. it to, yeah. W- yeah. absolutely, yeah. we need it to be yeah. systematic and cumulative yeah. all the while allowing teachers to bring their personality and their creativity to the fore and enjoy the role that they have chosen to, to um, play in this education game. Carla McNeil, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, I wish you well. As I said at the start of this program, I think you're doing God's work. Um, Carla is the founding um, and the managing director of Learning Matters. It's an organisation that works with teachers. They've been given, and the reason I've introduced her to you this on, on this Friday is because there's also some good news out there as well. Um, we talk a lot about things that we don't like. We talk about things that we dislike. We talk about things we hate. Um and we moan and we complain and we whinge and we whine. But there are some people out there who are making a positive difference on a daily basis. Uh, New Zealand's education system and standard has been declining internationally for the last 20 years. There's a little glimmer of hope here. Let us hope that Carla McNeil and her fellow acolytes can make that work. But also, if you want to be angry and stay angry, can I just leave you with this? We're where we are now. Because 20 years of educators and education bureaucrats has condemned a whole generation of kids to a failure that they created. Not the kids, the educators and the education bureaucrats.